Now, um, as always, I'm still a little bit uncertain about the tech. I think Tuesday presented uh, uh, Tuesday confirmed that. So, if I'm starting the PowerPoint presentation, uh, I'm expecting that you're seeing um, the screen. Um, and I, when I go to full screen, you should be seeing a screen of an illustration of what I believe is the Hoover Dam. And that's what's on my screen. And if you don't see that or if the slides don't advance, please, one of you, um, uh, unmic, uh, uh, make your mic live and speak to me. When it's full screen like this, I can't see the uh, meat um, sidelines and tell if something is in chat. So water use and management. Next to oxygen, the most important thing to people. This illustration shows what we do with water. And uh, impounding water is, on some level, a very good idea. But then the question of how sustainable our use is uh, always comes into question. One thing you can see from this vast surface that we see here behind the dam is the previous water level shown as a stark contrast between the white rock and the brown rock. This is basically a river flowing through very, very dry country. So the groundwater flowing on the surface is the only water they really have. Um, but if we impound it, we can basically save during periods of flood or periods of wet season uh, far upstream, save water for future use. So water resources, what are they? How do we measure them? How are they available? Is it constant or seasonal? Is it very wet to very dry? Uh, what happens when we are short on fresh water and water conservation are going to be issues of this chapter? I want to emphasize on some level every one of the ideas or interventions or uh, items of engineering that we talk about is a good idea on some level. But if you change the scale, it becomes a formula for a different outcome. So we are accustomed to thinking about water resources with respect to depletion and whether or not it's renewable. With respect to spoiling the water resource, if in fact we do not care for it, and even complete disappearance of a water resource, and I'll introduce a term here, fossil water, there are vast underground water deposits which are essentially static. They exist uh, beneath the continents in dry areas, and even though a huge amount of water is there, human scale use, which means things like irrigation or diversion, is sufficient to deplete it and exhaust it so that that water under the ground disappears. We'll have an idea of that or an example of that soon. We talk about the water in, on our planet. It is essential to our life, second most essential uh, element. And the hydrologic cycle is the way we express the existence and movement of water. It moves from the surface by evaporation. It returns to the surface by precipitation. And by surface, groundwater and uh, underground flow returns to the ocean. So it is constantly moving. The evaporation from the oceans is massive. And it in terms of the return, about 90% of the return falls directly back into the ocean. So the land only gets 10% of the water. Uh, that's precipitating. Plants do play a major role on land because uh, they are releasing water on a constant basis as they transpire. In Missouri, you can see this in July and August, where the sky, if you look out today, the sky is blue, the air is clear, <clears throat> pardon me, and it's crystal, you know, beautiful clear air because it's cool. But in July and August, we see a kind of a hazy appearance on some days for a period of time. And that's from the water, water vapor that's being pumped out by the vegetation that's so common on our surface. As always, we know that solar energy drives most of the important reactions uh, that are relevant to life. 
as well as energy capture, photosynthesis, solar energy drives the hydrological cycle. These uh, particular um, uh, figures show the distribution of water. Notice that it's a predictable distribution based on a couple of factors. Always we start with our Earth as a globe. That globe is tilted. It is spinning on an axis, so it is rotating, and it is revolving around the sun. That produces seasons. And the exposure of a surface of the Earth to that solar radiation is what drives the patterns of rainfall and precipitation that you see. Now the dark blue, light blue and green show the wetter areas and you can see that equator right across the center of this globe. South America, Africa and those uh, uh, Pacific Islands and Southeast Asia are those very, very wet places characterized by monsoon seasons where it rains all the time and huge amounts of groundwater. As you move away toward those dotted lines that we call the tropics and you get to a place where the seasons are characterized now by frost or even long periods of freezing, the water diminishes. There are certain places like the coast of Canada and Alaska and the coast of uh, Chile um, where coastal environments in temperate regions receive significant amounts of water. So these patterns are superimposed on variable seasons from year to year. And this is something we're confronting in a very major way now as I, not necessarily global warming, but climate change affects the amount of precipitation from place to place. We do see a predictable effects as water moves over the surface. On the right side, you see here, uh, by the way, this is a Hawaiian island, as moisture-laden air off of the Pacific Ocean comes in and hits this island, it is lifted up by the elevation. As it goes up, it cools, and that cooling causes precipitation and massive amounts of rainfall. So on the airflow side, it's a very, very wet island and a tropical rainforest type vegetation. However, as you go over the top, you begin to descend. And as you descend, this water, which is basically, I mean, this air, which is basically dumped most of its water, it expands and it warms, which means that its relative humidity goes down. And there's a backside of the island, which is characterized by very, very dry um, uh, seasonal um, uh, a very, very dry season. You can see this effect on continents as well. As we flow over the Cascades and dump the water, then there's the Central Valley, which is much more dry, but does allow for some evaporation from the rivers there. And then over the Sierra Nevada, and you have a wet side facing uh, west, and over the top, uh, the Great Basin Desert, uh, as that air uh, uh, proceeds and, and a rainfall diminishes. We talk about water on Earth, we talk about compartments. A compartment is just an easily seen and easily characterized uh, mass of water. The oceans account for most of it, 97% of the liquid water in the oceans. Because it is saline, it is of a very different character than fresh water. 90% of the Earth's biomass is found in the ocean, so most of the life on Earth is there. And the major role in moderating the Earth's climate, and especially with respect to water, is um, the oceans. The currents, remembering that water is a fluid, will be important in distributing the warm and cold temperatures around the Earth. So the position on the Earth and the relative to the sun will determine how much solar radiation you get. And if you're hitting the land, you're going to warm the land and re-radiate from the land or conduct through the solid material. However, if you're hitting the water or if you're warming the atmosphere, both of those are fluids and so they can move in very, very often predictable ways. And that's illustrated here as the major ocean currents
whether those currents are warm or cold. These are some of the major currents that we find. These are essentially, if you can imagine, a massive river flowing through water and carrying temperature with it. It produces major coastal effect on the uh, environments and the ecosystems that are developed. Um, I, I want to emphasize that title here, Global Ocean Currents Today, so that if you look at the Atlantic Ocean, you notice major cold current and a major warm current flowing largely north and south. That's a relatively recent development with the closure of the connection between North America and South America. Until that closure occurred and disrupted and stopped flow east to west, uh, there was an opening between North and South America, and so there were major east-west currents distributing temperature. Now, I, I raise that because, the, and the detail is fairly well known, it's a complete study in itself to figure out how those ocean currents uh, were changing. However, it means that climate today is very different than it was several tens of million years ago. Um, the coastal environments are affected by the dis redistribution of those ocean currents. So one compartment is frozen water. It's important because uh, we live in a temperate environment. In the tropics, you hardly think of ice at all. But around the world, glaciers, ice, and snow account for 2.4% of the world's water that's classified as fresh. Now, in frozen state, it's static. Glaciers, ice caps, and snow fields hold it, and often, because these form on continental masses or on land, they hold it above the level of the liquid water sea level. Um, because of that, we have a great concern about climate change that will warm the earth. If 2.4% of the water that is fresh melts and becomes liquid, we do see that uh, a rising of sea level that could threaten human habitations. Many of the large cities, because of the attractiveness of coastal environments, many of the large cities are built close to the coast and only a few feet above sea level. I know that in New Orleans, there are places um, which are, you know, city and, and uh, parks and homes, which are actually below sea level. When you get a good hard rain, you have to wait uh, for the pumps to come on and pump that over on the other side of the levee. So that's just how close some of our major cities are to inundation. Infiltration refers to the process of precipitation falling on the land and then working its way into the porous soil, into the porous rock layers and moving through those rock layers. There are rock layers that are impermeable. So this basically the distribution of water around land is something that is a water compartment important to consider. The groundwater system I show tilted layers, some of them impermeable, as is marked on this slide, some of them uh, permeable. And so you might see, as you do in Missouri, a tilted rock layer that's porous, rain falls on the exposed, let's say, sandstone, and gravity pushes it downhill. Uh, it is slanted uh, to water, it fills its lower end. Well, if its lower end um, is at a place that is exposed to the ground surface, then you have an outflow of water uh, like a spring. Big Spring in Missouri is our largest and is emitting, I think, 400,000 gallons per minute, per day, I'm sorry. The major rivers of the world carry groundwater in unimaginable quantities. Now, we were familiar with the mighty Mississippi, and you'll notice it barely makes the middle of this list, there are many that are as large as the Mississippi in terms of its discharge. That means the end of the pipe, what's coming out. So 19,000 down to 16,000 do show uh, things, uh, rivers that are on the scale of our Mississippi River right on our doorstep. Above that, you can see the amount doubling 
and tripling and eventually getting to the Amazon. The Amazon out, outclasses every river in the world by several um, uh, multipliers. So three times the Orinoco and uh, probably another four or five times of the Congo River uh, in Africa. This, these massive rivers produce huge seasonal changes and huge um, uh, dependence on uh, uh, dry ground for uh, certain periods of time, uh, completely inundated by seasonal flood for the rest of the year. Lakes and ponds are smaller impoundments. Generally, lake and pond are just distinguished by their size. If it's small enough and shallow enough that water can, uh, plants can root in the bottom, typically we call it a pond if they're larger, so there is deep water, too deep for plants to grow up to the surface so that plants are restricted to the edge. We call it a lake. Uh, this is a sort of a... Um, a um, loose definition, but lakes and ponds are also typically drainage pockets that are on some term uh, uh, impermanent. They are temporary. So the fact that they're collecting water means water is flowing into them. They, it brings sediment and those lakes and ponds fill up and eventually will um, um, become more of a water course or a river or stream. Wetlands are shallow and they have a vital role because of their uh, tremendous productivity. Shallow water with deep soil and high light. Um, that produces warm temperatures, it produces plant growth, and often wetlands in temperate and tropical regions uh, do experience productivity and growth year-round. Um, uh, a lot of uh, infiltration of aquifers depends on the pressure of water at the surface, and wetlands have a big role in that. If we disturb wetlands, and they're great candidates for disturbance, many wetlands are coastal, so they're near the uh, ocean, very attractive building sites for cities, so harbors and ports uh, are uh, sites of cities. Uh, where rivers outflow, uh, um, you have a ready highway into the interior, uh, lots of reasons for looking at wetland areas. Uh, wetlands have been largely uh, converted and disturbed. You can see the statement here. Half of U.S. wetlands have now been converted to another use. Draining them for agriculture is a, is a tremendous uh, and leading cause of the destruction of wetlands. The atmosphere is very small. It's gas instead of liquid, and very, very low amount of water is actually carried by the humidity in the air. Um, it also is active in evaporation precipitation cycles that are very rapid, but it does distribute fresh water over the land masses. And that distribution of water is directly correlated with the productivity of living organisms. In terms of availability and use, the issue is presence or absence. And then uh, with respect to availability, how much precipitation, how much water is available. And finally, um, with respect to use, are we using it in a renewable way? This is a place where St. Louis, Missouri is very fortunate being on the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers and upstream having several drainages, uh, the Mississippi, the Illinois, and downstream very quickly uh, the Ohio River and below that the uh, Arkansas River, uh, the Red River um, draining into it. So a, a fairly constant water supply flowing by St. Louis. Two-thirds of the water carried in rivers and streams actually occurs in floods that are at present not controlled, meaning that it is large and violent. And up until now, it's been fine just to wait until the flood waters go down and take our water uh, when the water's flowing uh, more calmly. 
However, it does mean there's seasonal variation and there's an abundance that is not being used. Um, we have um, readily accessible renewable supplies only ab uh, provide about 400,000 gallons per person per year. So looking at the breakdown, the oceans, a huge uh, portion of all water with only about 2.4%, what we call fresh, of that fresh water, almost 90% of it is ice and snow. So what we call groundwater and surface water is more like 12 to 13%. And over on the right side, you see liquid fresh surface water, which is the water we're talking about for life. Lakes and reservoirs, soil moisture and moisture in plants and animals are major parts. The atmosphere, wetlands, rivers and streams contributing their smaller portions. The greatest water user is agriculture. And uh, right up to the brink of exhausting uh, a water supply and causing it to disappear. Uh, agriculture has 70% of the total water withdrawal. And that is used to cultivate the plants that provide our materials and our food. Um, sometimes our choices have a, a very important effect on water. One of the things that we prefer in uh, the United States is a meat rich diet. And of our choices, there are different amounts of water required to raise different meat animals. So to take it from small to large, chickens to pigs to cows produces a huge increase in the amount of water required. Raising a kilogram of beef, that's 2.5 pounds of beef, uh, in our modern operations, concentrated feeding operations feedlots, takes 15,000 liters of water per kilogram, 15,000 liters, huge amount. Now that gives us a diet that's very, very nutritious, high in protein, and with respect to our preferences here in the United States, something greatly to be desired. And that, as, uh, again, like I said, everything we'll talk about today on some level is a good idea. Is it a good idea to have beef as a nutrient supply? It is absolutely. A good idea. However, when the population gets to a certain level, human population is increasing, so the desirability of beef and the demand for beef increases, and eventually to a point that you look at the water consumption and say, well, wait a minute, are we going to have enough water into the future? A great example of depletion of fresh water is the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea is in Asia. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are the countries that have portions of the Aral Sea. One time, the fourth largest lake, uh, inland sea in the world, and now 90% of its volume, uh, has been um, diverted. That means loss. That means a drop of the level of lake. And the primary reason is agriculture, especially rice and cotton. These are dry regions. If you go back to that world map, you'll find these areas are relatively arid. It's an odd thing that arid areas sometimes have good soil. And if you pour water on it, you can grow anything. California is a good example of a place that has a long, long dry season every year. But, the, but it has good soil and it has relatively uh, close sources of groundwater. So you pour water on it and you raise tremendous crops. In Davis, California, when I was working as a cowboy, there uh, the neighbor raised tomatoes on his land. And they were able to plant and harvest three crops of tomatoes every year. So from February through the end of November, they were growing tomatoes. Um, with the decrease in uh, water in the Aral Sea, commercial fisheries have also been lost. So here is the proof in the pudding. Aral Sea, upper left, 1973, upper right, 1999. 
lower left 2008 and lower right 2015. Uh, the comparative photos show that that western edge on the left is the deep portion of the lake and all that's left uh, in 2015 uh, of the larger body of water is a very, very shallow remnant of its former uh, depth. Domestic and industrial water use um, accounts for only about 6% of withdrawals. That doesn't sound like much. Um, but in fact, domestic water is what allows cities to exist. Um, in addition to oxygen supply, water supply is the critical thing that we need on a constant basis every day. It is a miracle the level of water quality that we have and the consistency of its delivery. Um, we do have, in this case, many engineering solutions. If you look at the very simple um, engineering of water efficient appliances, dishwashers and washing machines with leading the way, uh, flushing the toilet, it turns out that water was abundant and so the easy thing to do is to use water. And we have now engineered remarkable differences in our appliances that will allow for significant savings of water. A typical household water use is shown here. Look at that largest red portion is just from flushing the toilet. Laundry showers, faucets and leaks account for most of the other water use. You'll, you'll notice here, there isn't anything for drinking or cooking. That's in that other. We're using water in a, a um, dramatic way. Another thing is that this is household use and it doesn't account for, for example, gardening or watering lawns. And uh, it is amazing uh, to many places in the world that we use potable water, drinkable water to water our lawns and our uh, our garden plants. That means that we go to all the, pro the trouble of processing that water into drinkable form and then uh, we basically put it on the ground. Um, the worldwide condition is quite a bit different than the condition here in the United States. 67% um, of the world's populations lack indoor plumbing and have to carry water to their house from outside their home. Um, in the home, it may, if it's available, it may be very expensive. For example, the example here from Peru, a poor family uses one-sixth as much water as a typical middle-class family in the U.S., one-sixth. But it pays three times as much, and they still then have to boil the water in order to make it safe to drink. Um, I think the concern for water and water rights as it affects, directly affects the welfare of human population is very much on the rise. I know Matt Damon has, has uh, declared water availability and water used to be his personal issue and is uh, uh, producing public service announcements uh, and other work in favor of worldwide water availability. The depletion of groundwater has been measured. The data is there. The question is, are we paying attention? I think if we turn on the faucet and clean water comes out, we kind of don't care about the data. 40% uh, of the fresh water in the U.S. is groundwater. 50% of Americans depend on this groundwater for drinking and domestic use. Um, the depletion of groundwater depends on whether it is, how much water is there under the surface? What are the porous rock layers and how much can they hold? Is that water moving? Is it an underground river? Or is it essentially an underground lake that is uh, very little affected by the rainfall up above? And that brings this example to bear. Um, I mentioned the Ogallala Aquifer. It's named for Ogallala is a tribe of the Sioux people, and it lent its name to one layer of porous sandstone that goes all the way, as you can see, the base of the Panhandle of Texas, all the way up into North Dakota and the corner of Wyoming. 
it underlies eight states with different depths. And this isn't the depth. I do know uh, as a fact that there were places where the Ogallala Aquifer had 400 feet of depth under certain farmlands in the center of this distribution. However, um, the uh, pumping of water has caused tremendous change in the level of that underground aquifer so that in some places that depended on groundwater, pumping in the center for irrigation for crops has left the perimeter of this without water. So towns are being abandoned and people are having to develop alternate um, uh, strategies for household water because of the depletion of this aquifer. And you can see that uh, uh, drops of 20 and 30 and 40 feet are recorded. So I, I, I was interested. I encountered such a difference in attitude in the farmers. I, I cut through this area, starting in Seymour, Texas and Oklahoma, western Kansas and up into Nebraska. So I had a chance to talk to a lot of people who uh, had experience with the Ogallala Aquifer. And um, when I was cutting wheat in the 1960s, uh, they were averaging 20 bushels an acre of wheat in western Kansas on dry ground. When water became available, or uh, I, let me just put that differently, when people started buying massive pumps, typically the caterpillar engines were favored to place in the center, in the edge of a corner of a, of a field and pump water to the surface and then arrange that water so it would flow through the field and irrigate the wheat. They started planting different kinds of wheat. That wheat uh, could yield higher if you put lots of water on it. And so within a period of 15 years, I was back and visited a family I knew. And they said, no, now the county average is 60 bushels of wheat per acre. That was a short-term gain. But when the depletion gets to the point that water is no longer available, the only option is to go back to dry ground wheat. So there were places where water was dropping three feet a year from agricultural pumping. The U.S. Geological Survey's estimate of recharge rate, which means how much water is entering the aquifer from the surface. This is a relatively dry region with limited rainfall. Uh, the recharge rate was between one quarter and one half inch per year. So it was clear this was a formula for exhaustion. There's also a coastal effect that results from porous rock layers. We call these uh, places lenses because they basically provide a pathway for the infiltration or intrusion of salt water in under the surface of the ground. You can see the windmill probing down into a freshwater uh, pocket, and you can see where the pipe is that fresh water has been drained away. The salt water that's coming in, in the below is uh, heavier, and as a result, it's possible to stratify fresh water on salt water. But when you start pumping, that level gets down to salt water, and the water that's pumped by that windmill will become saline, which makes it unsuitable for drinking or uh, household use, as well as for irrigation. You can sort of see this effect in the Mississippi in the spring. You'll notice that there are flows. I spend a lot of time at the confluence where the Mississippi and Missouri join. And there's low land there between those rivers. And I noticed several times where water was rising in the riverbanks and did not overflow the banks. So it was well contained within the banks of the river. And yet pools would rise up in the dry ground between the banks, even, even if it was protected by levees. And that's because of these porous lenses that you see. Uh, if, sand, uh, if a sand layer is exposed under uh, on the bank of the river and then is uh, exposed in the low ground between the river, when the water level rises, then you get a temporary pond that literally does just rise up out of the ground. 
This issue of salinization is important. Uh, the Ogallala Aquifer is very, very good water, very clean water. You can drink it typically right out of the pump. However, it is something that does carry a certain amount of sodium and chloride and other ions and minerals. Uh, in dissolved form. So if you use it year after year after year after year after year for irrigation in an area that doesn't have a lot of rainfall, the salt piles up. So the soil becomes salty, salinized, and uh, the uh, agricultural yields go down. Versions of water are age old. China has man managed water for well over a thousand years back in the uh, dynasties uh, that uh, preceded the modern day. They diverted and impounded water in that eastern area. That's why their massive agriculture gave support to such large populations. Um, that particular uh, uh, pattern was adequate as long as you had in, in, in those days, uh, China was a very populous area, but the water was abundant compared to the population. But now there's a huge crisis. And why? The, the why is because of the massive increase in population. So they've proposed a water diversion project that will move water from one place to another. Typically, this is to serve population centers. And they're going to build canals to move water from the Yangtze River to northern China uh, to support population and to support uh, agriculture. Preliminary cost is 400 billion yuan or 62 billion U.S. dollars. The California aqueduct is a smaller scale example of that where water from the western slope of the Sierra Nevada all the way up uh, to the Sacramento area is uh, diverted and sent down the, Cal the California aqueduct all the way to Los Angeles and San Diego, supporting population centers there. Dams. Dams are um, impounding water, and the presence of water uh, on some level is a good thing. But some negative effects of uh, farmlands and towns, areas uh, uh, are displacing people. I know at, around Lawrence, Kansas, in the University of Kansas, there was a reservoir that was built just southwest of town that's called Clinton Reservoir. In uh, damming that small river and in uh, accumulating the um, water in that impoundment, um, they uh, inundated the site of the town of Clinton, Kansas. So everyone had to, was bought out and had to move to the ridges around. Dams do have an effect on changing the pressure on geologic strata and earthquakes result. Fish migration, uh, aquatic habitats for native species are changed. Often wetlands are covered by deep water. And uh, spring floods that drop sediment when they leave the banks and basically enrich agricultural lands are typically prevented uh, in the area of the dam. Sediment does limit reservoirs. In the scale of our human lives, our impoundments, our lakes, like the Lake of the Ozarks, uh, seem to be permanent. However, they're constantly bringing sediment and filling in uh, from bottom to top. Uh, within a century, these are expected to fill in permanently and produce land where there was once water. It also does affect the distribution of nutrients as well as water um, downstream from the dam as you interrupt those natural cycles of flooding and movement. The climate change is always something we have to consider, and climate change does affect water supplies in a dramatic way. Not just less water, I think that's been the emphasis as people think, well, it's going to get hot and dry up. and uh, there's not going to be so much rainfall. But where the rain falls, there are going to be areas which get much less rainfall, but there will be areas that get more. Growth zones will move north, so area that was too cold for a certain crop might develop a different agricultural ideal in terms of making a profit when you're farming. Uh, when we combine that um, with 
the increase in population growth, we have uh, a, a absolute prediction of water shortages around the world. Uh, reduced precipitation and increased evaporation result in 10 to 30 percent reduction in runoff. And especially in these marginal arid regions uh, in the next 50 years. So places that are uh, areas of tremendous production. Uh, the number one wheat producing state in the country is Kansas, and it has been for year after year after year. However, it is a place of marginal rainfall. It's terrific for growing grasses, but any significant drop in the annual rainfall is going to have a severe effect on wheat production. Around the world, we have a lot of water shortages. And we've been seeing some of these in the news recently. Southern Australia is having a prolonged drought and water shortages. And this year, the, um, the uh, dry conditions there were underlined by wildfires that burned out of control for periods of weeks to month. Chinese, as I said, China is, is facing a water crisis. And again, the balance between availability and population is a significant factor. In Syria and in Yemen, it is threatening the food supply. It kind of brings up an interesting point about, about history and water. When we study history in this country, we're raised with stories of the uh, empire of Egypt. Egypt was on the Nile. The empire of Mesopotamia, the fertile crescent uh, around the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, in China, the development around the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers in eastern China where there's good agricultural land. These flowing rivers were the source of life and of support for large populations. So as we push the value of that water supply, we run into the potential of conflict between peoples uh, about who gets access. And this is a place where population growth, uh, declining supplies, um, political and cultural entities, who likes who, who hates who, and um, that old point of if you don't have something, one option is always to just take it from your neighbor leads to conflicts. There have been water skirmishes in Israel, a typically dry area on the Mediterranean. Turkey and Iraq uh, have had uh, uh, conflicts over the Fertile Crescent region. And uh, in Kenya, wars over water are uh, now uh, uh, frequent. One option and one thing we can all, we all look at are strategies which actually use less water because when you design a solution in the historic past, if there's more water than you can use, if the availability of water is not an issue, you typically design the fastest and cheapest way of solving your problem. And that way is often uh, using excess water. Um, Water conservation message, uh, methods will have a big impact on the resource side of the water problems that we have. Land banking uh, in areas of low rainfall like Nebraska and um, the Dakotas, Montana, they don't plant every square inch. They divide their agricultural land for grain into strips and they will plant alternate strips across the sections and and uh, the between the strips they will leave fallow land. So uh, there is a season of rest and then a season of production. This land banking reduces your yield but in fact ensures better maintenance of soil fertility and of um, uh, water table maintenance. Uh, walking wetlands, uh, a rotational method of um, flooding wetlands and then letting them dry out, restores fertility 
and again, uh, they, they talk about resting the land. And um, while they're doing that, they provide habitat for a wetland species. A migratory waterfowl are the, the big species that attracts attention because of the popularity and the profitability of hunting ducks and geese. Um, endangered species protection uh, uh, and the money that's available to fund them uh, are in fact being used to support new farming practices and water conservation. Here is a picture of a Klamath Lake uh, that's in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, snow geese are known for their huge migration and aggregations and this is showing a large flock of snow geese. Um, the Central Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway diverge right here in St. Louis and um, there are uh, areas of concentration you can see during the spring no uh, migration where hundreds of thousands of snow geese are possible because of the maintenance of a small wetland somewhere along the river. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> we can apply our technology. There are some places where moisture is in the clouds, but it seldom rains. We can seed clouds to provide rain in specific strategic locations. Um, one very attractive and uh, very difficult problem is to use the abundance of water in the oceans through desalination. Basically take the salt out and uh, use either uh, ocean water or the more dilute brackish water of wetlands and estuaries uh, to produce fresh water. The rub is that it's three to four times more expensive. So there isn't really a, a shortage of water. It's just that it's in a state that's too expensive to process given our current choices. Um, the issue of resource use in the United States is a very ticklish one because we have such abundant resource and um, uh, through history the issue was if you can go to a public area and get the resource water or uh, ore or timber uh, the government would in fact give you the material uh, for your own uh, private gain. In the Middle East, where they have lots of money now because of oil's popularity, um, they are uh, basically building their society on desalinated water. So the, the um, technology is there, but it is um, a expensive proposition. For right now, our supply is sufficient. We take ours from the Mississippi River north of St. Louis, and our water supply is uh, Actually, as a public water supply, St. Louis has a very, very good uh, water uh, quality. Domestic conservation. Um, estimates suggest that we could save as much as half of our domestic water use without any change in lifestyle. Uh, the largest use is toilet flushing. This is something I know about because I have to admit I sort of had to be convinced over a long period of time when I replaced all my toilets with low flush toilets. And I find them um, different in some ways, but very, very uh, equivalent to the previous uh, toilets that I had. Uh, there are dry toilets and anaerobic digesters, which um, uh, produce uh, the same effect uh, with much, much less toilet use. Um, we also have a lot of water that can be reclaimed and recycled, and I kind of mentioned this issue before. Right now, the cheapest way was to produce one water system and to produce potable water, which means safe for drinking, for cooking, and for public health issues, and to use that for all of our uses, watering our plants, um, basically uh, putting them on our gardens. Uh, is sewage effluent is something that we began by just dumping it into the river, producing two problems, water waste in the water carrying the material, and um, uh, uh, in some cases, pollution of uh, 
rivers and uh, other water sources. Uh, this sign may in fact become more and more common where water is reclaimed and it is sanitized to the point we would say it will not cause disease, but it is not purified to the point where we can use it for drinking or cooking. But that means a separate water supply. Uh, this water, irrigation uh, water, can be produced at much, much lower cost and it can carry some benefits so that you can leave nitrates and phosphates at higher levels and introduce a level of fertilization at the same time. But America's capitalism, America always is driven by price. And this is uh, something that has affected us from our earliest history as a nation. So we have worked out policies that uh, emphasize production and efficiency, uh, profit, and the laws that were written do show the differences in water resource. Well, eastern states have more rainfall, and it was based on who had the right to use the rivers. In western uh, regions, uh, there was a time where a bunch of very clever people bought up water rights, whether they lived there or not. And so they appropriated those rights when development got to the point water was essential. They had a commanding business position. Uh, the idea of uh, those rights, though, it, it leads to a use it or lose it. If you have less, if you use less this year, then the rights that you retain for next year are reduced. And so it leads to conflicts over water and water use. Oops, sorry. Um, so we do see that our current water use policy often depends on, number one, giving away the resource, the water that is there that is a public resource and essentially subsidizing the um, uh, provision of that water for hydroelectric power or irrigation. So the, the tax monies pay for the building of dams or of flow systems to distribute the water. But um, the water that's delivered for um, the farmers to use um, is only uh, charged the cost of the delivery uh, is is charged uh, as a fee. So it amounts to a subsidy. In some places, the, you can see this estimate, a half a million dollars per form per year of tax money has gone into providing that water, that irrigation water to the farmer uh, to grow their crops. So the imbalances that have resulted from uh, uh, water policy laws that are a hundred years old uh, at trying to account for a fair and equitable practice today with our higher population and also our higher standard of living and higher expectation for water provision. All of that is coming together in a critical way. Um, price is the big issue for us right now. No one is going to elect a water development strategy that will increase the price um, uh, for the majority of consumers. The idea is still the natural resource is free and some people can own it and benefit from its sale, uh, whereas the real cost is borne by the majority of the population. So, excellent. We got through that PowerPoint. I'm going to end the show. Stop the recording. And in just a moment, open the mic.